No, buddy. All right, and uh, good evening, and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and, uh, and we're here to welcome all of you for the uh, in for the classic Saturday night free speech forum. This place does have a few rules. One is uh, one fool at a time, and the other is no personal attacks. Boo! Uh, boo. We uh, start this uh, thing with the following format. We have uh, first, a few announcements. Second, our speaker will present. Third, there'll be a question and answer period where we ask questions and not uh, pontificate because the third, part of our thing is called the rebuttal period where you'll be free to pontificate for up to five minutes depending on how many people we have for the rebuttal period. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the subject matter, but uh, you're given a chance to rebut. And now I know that you yeah. want to get to the subject. So, we will do that. The subject is psychedelics as medicine. And Bruce Seawack, We'll see the next uh, to the lovely uh, Mrs. Seawick. Uh, <laughs> will be speaking to us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the person that has a smiley face under their drink just got a surprise. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay, so my name is Bruce Seawick. I'm a therapist by trade. I also am an addiction counselor. I, I'm an adjunct faculty at. Uh, does this come out? Does it come out? Yeah, it does. Uh, I'm an adjunct faculty at two colleges, two community colleges. Uh, College of DuPage and the Wright Community College. Uh, I'm teaching one of the few classes uh, for credit on psychedelics uh, because we are in the psychedelic renaissance and within our lifetime, uh, psychedelics will be approved by the FDA to use with intractable conditions, probably uh, PTSD and end of life anxiety. So I've been doing this, I've been on the lecture circuit about psychedelics uh, for about 10 years. And it's, got, it's very easy now. It was a hard sell uh, 10 years ago, but not, not so much anymore. So I want to start off with a little video uh, of uh, the first major psychedelic conference we had in the country a couple years ago. I presented at it. It was sold out. And it's a little uh, summary of the direction we're heading. They're the drugs once associated with hippies in the 1960s. LSD, hallucinogenic mushrooms, once feared as a one-way ticket to insanity, now being discussed as real medicine to treat real problems. Well, I am a firm believer. I've seen it work in many people. Rick Doblin imagines a day when patients will be able to go to their doctor's offices for their doses of LSD or ecstasy pills. I think eventually there will be psychedelic clinics regulated by FDA with people who are specially trained to administer the psychedelics and people will come to them for medical purposes or for rites of passage in their life or personal growth. Doblin comes with credentials. He's got a PhD from Harvard in public policy and has spent years studying psychedelics. Proving that there is a convention for practically everything, researchers from around the world have come to San Jose, California to talk about psychedelic drugs. Here at the Holiday Inn, they're sharing stories about those drugs and their hope that one day they will become a regular part of medicine. Here at the conference, we found Sarah Huntley, who says she was abused emotionally and physically as a child. It made me feel worthless most of the time and that um, I was a burden to that member of my family and that I wasn't really worth that burden. She says the abuse stripped her of self-confidence. Then, as a 17-year-old high school student, she started taking the drug ecstasy scientifically known as MDMA. MDMA, or ecstasy you see right here, was developed in the early 20th century as a possible appetite suppressant. Of course, today people use it for its hallucinogenic effects. Users say it can heighten their senses and lower their inhibitions. It seems like the color contrast is what... Now 23, Sarah says MDMA helped get her life back. 
using the MDMA helped ease my, my sense of fear and defensiveness. They talk about being happy. Psychiatrist Michael Midhofer has never examined Sarah, but believes psychedelics hold tremendous promise. Through a study approved by the Food and Drug Administration, he's been administering MDMA to patients with post-traumatic stress disorder. As a doctor, what made you think that psychedelics could be helpful? Well, you know, we know that the treatment of PTSD involves revisiting the trauma in a therapeutic session. So what we, our idea is that MDMA may bring people into kind of an optimal zone of arousal where they can connect with their feelings, but they aren't going to be overwhelmed by fear. For advocates, the key is matching the drug with the problem. Psilocybin found in certain mushrooms might be used to treat anxiety related to terminal illness. The same for LSD. It can vary according to what issues they're working with, how much denial they have, but we would like to have psychiatrists and psychotherapists have access to a whole tool, tool chest of psychedelics that they can use at appropriate times. But some doctors question whether psychedelics are ever appropriate. Stanford psychiatrist David Spiegel says there's no scientific literature yet to back up any positive claims. The key issue in the treatments of this disorder is teaching people how to access their memories and feelings about the trauma in a controlled way. And psychedelics are anything but a controlled experience. For now, that's the mainstream medical consensus. Maybe if you get pure MDMA. But supporters here hope that over time, psychedelics will be seen less as a bad trip and more as legitimate medicine. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, the bad acid trip of the 70s is over. This is part two of the psychedelic renaissance. And I'm going to talk to you about the science of psychedelics. i got to figure out how to get the power point. Okay, so. Oh, bicycle day. Bicycle day. Good day to ride your bicycle, April 19th. The day Albert Hoffman intentionally ingested LSD. On April 16th, he accidentally uh, it was absorbed through his skin pores, and on April 19th, he intentionally ingested LSD and took the most famous bike ride in history home. This day is a high holy day in the psychedelic community. We sell each other, send each other psychedelic cards and bicycle cards and uh, to remember the day Albert Hoffman started it all. God bless Albert Hoffman. He lived to over a hundred. Wow. There's a uh, picture of a actual uh, drawing of uh, Albert Hoffman by Robert Bonoza, a visionary artist. Uh, on his 100th birthday, they threw a hell of a party for him in Basel, Switzerland, if any of you were there. So the research started immediately following um, his discovery. It was considered something that had a lot of uh, psychiatric and therapeutic potential. They were treating alcoholics in uh, Canada with it. Uh, in the United States, we had the famous Good Friday experiments where they gave theology students, half of them got magic mushrooms and the other half got placebo. Uh, Jensen was using it to treat alcoholics in high doses. And then here in the United States is where they accidentally, not accidentally, where they discovered that LSD had potential to be used with the dying. The uh, researchers, Cast and Collins, uh, we're looking to see if LSD could be an analgesic for pain, and so they dosed people with LSD, and what they found out was that it didn't eliminate the pain, but it eliminated emotional pain by the experience, and that people that die with less emotional pain die with less physical pain, and also some uh, research on uh, autistic children. Uh, Bill Wilson, the co-founder of AA, was a big proponent of LSD psychotherapy, uh, he did take LSD in California uh, back in the day, uh, and he was actually wanting to make that part of the AA program, but the leadership was very opposed to uh, treating alcoholism with another drug. This actually is a letter uh, that uh, he wrote to Timothy Leary where he talks about the AAs here in New York have been part of the development of LSD possibilities, and uh, talks about the uh, LSD alkaloids and, and the uh, the fact that he feels this would be very useful to the community. Uh, in Europe, Czechoslovakia especially, there was research being done, pretty major research. Uh, the first researcher is Dr. Mylon Hausner, 
uh, in over a 10 year period, he uh, administered over 3,000 sessions and the, the dose of it of LSD was between um, 30 and 400 micrograms, which is a pretty healthy dose. Uh, 60 plus sessions, usually average of 5 to 20 with the option of weekend hospitalization. So you could go uh, to a hospital on weekends and do psychedelic therapy. Dr. Stanislav Groff, who is most known for uh, LSD research, did 4,000 sessions. I met him at the conference that you saw uh, at the beginning of the video about. And uh, what he did is he ended up in the United States at the Maryland uh, Psychiatric Research Center, and they uh, established a protocol there using LSD to treat the dying, uh, administering 450 micrograms of LSD. So here's where we're at. This is a this was done on a Mac, so it's a little distorted on a, on a PC. But basically, you have three phases or four phases, uh, and during which the drugs can be offered to the public at uh, phase three, um, and it all has to do with numbers. So the the number of people in the research projects depend on uh, on the phase. It's either 20, 20 to 300, or over 300. With LSD, we're in phase two. With MDMA, we're currently doing phase two studies. Uh, DMT, uh, nothing being done. Ayahuasca, there's some limited studies. There's some interest in ayahuasca. It's uh, used in, for religious purposes in uh, Brazil and in the United States. Psilocybin, phase two. And then mescaline is out to phase three because the Native American church uses uh, uh, mescaline in the form of peyote as part of the religious ceremonies. There's also ketamine is out to phase three because ketamine is a schedule two. So there's actually uh, a, a, a Russian psychiatrist is, is doing ketamine psychotherapy in Florida using uh, intramuscular injections of ketamine. Uh, both ibogaine and marijuana are in phase two. Uh, and then what really kicked it off was in 1991, Rick Strassman initiated research using uh, dimethyltryptamine, which is a very short acting psychedelic. If they call it a businessman's trip, you're up and down in about 30 minutes. And then in 1995, Charles Grove uh, concluded with his research that MDMA is, a, is okay to use in a controlled setting. They are also uh, looking at ibogaine to treat opiates. Uh, Deborah Mash in 1995, also using ketamine to treat uh, opiate and alcohol. Also the use of psilocybin in uh, 2001 by Francesco Marino to treat uh, OCD. And it was the insight that the people got under the influence of the mushroom that help with the OCD. So just, just be aware of that. And also, and you probably read it, there's a lot of press about using ketamine to treat depression. It seems to relieve depression maybe two weeks at a time. So that's pretty impressive. Now this was probably the most groundbreaking ceremony, uh, ceremony, the most groundbreaking research of late. This was in 2006, kind of a replication of the uh, Good Friday experiment. They gave psilocybin to 24 people and the name of the, they entitled the research, Psilocybin Can Occasion Mystical Type Experiences Having Substantial and Sustained Personal Meaning and Spiritual Significance. And what they found was that people, even if it was an anxious experience, considered it amongst the single most in their lifetime, uh, you're looking at 20%, among the top five, over 50%, uh, top 10, uh, maybe 20, 25%, once every five years maybe closer to 30 percent. So what people were saying was that even if the experience was uncomfortable, it was a very powerful experience. It's like therapy. Therapy isn't always comfortable. Life isn't, you know, uh, the Shirley Temple, you know, lollipop ship. So what did, what did they say about the research? Um, we're all wired for this experience. One of the researchers said, we are wired for these mystical experiences that happen using psychedelics. This, we are hardwired for it. Uh, Dave Nichols, who makes some of the research chemicals, said that psilocybin occasion experiences are very similar to a naturally occurring mystical states. And Harriet DeWitt, at the University of Chicago, who is doing research on psychedelics right now, as we speak, said it's time for the psychopharmacologists to open their minds and laboratories to the full domain of human drug experience. So, so the tide is turning. The big excitement is about MDMA to treat PTSD. Uh, if, if you know anything about treating people with PTSD, there's no good chemical intervention, there's no good medication, 
I'm sure the doctor will agree. Uh, so, as it turns out, MDMA is a perfect adjunct to psychotherapy to use in treating the PTSD uh, victims. Uh, this is this research was done using treatment resistant veterans. So these were people that had received therapy and it wasn't doing them any good and they were still experiencing the symptoms. Uh, so this concluded. Now what is the neuropsychology of PTSD as far as the symptoms? You've got the amygdala which is the fear and flight response in the middle of the brain there, part of the, the, the brain stem. Uh, very sensitive to, to, to trauma and emotions. Uh, and when, when you have PTSD, this keeps firing and you're unable to kind of control it with the, you know, the cortical part of your brain. Uh, so everything is kind of haywire. Uh, basically, the amygdala is activated. Uh, and as I said, the thought process here is kind of suppressed. So thinking, analyzing, organizing, and memory is very impaired using, uh, when you have PTSD. Nightmares, flashbacks, numbness. Depression, increased fear response, difficulty sleeping, uh, interpersonal difficulties, and anxiety are, are specific symptoms. Basically, PTSD victims are unable to, uh, to fully leave the past or engage in the present. That kind of characterizes what it feels like. So what does it look like? Basically, the client does the work. They get the MDMA. You're just the sitter. You're the therapist sitting there and it's non-directive. You support what's happening. If there's the, the clients have eye shades on, headphones, listening to music, structuring the, the experience, and if they're in trouble or need to speak with somebody, there is the psychiatrist therapist there. So alternating inner and outer focus, emphasis on ex experiencing the emotions and staying with them, and then it becomes a template to refer back to. So imagine this is the first time, maybe, in these people's lives that they felt safe in their body because of this window of the MDMA experience. Okay, and then it becomes a template to refer back to. So this is what it looks like. Here's how significant the relief was in three sessions. <clears throat> this is the placebo, and these are two measurements of, of PTSD. Um, as far as the uh, mean caps here, you see it's very significantly reduced. And then the same, the impact of event scale talks about how uh, traumatic the events are, you see a very significant drop with the, uh, with the MDMA group. So it increased, what, is, what does MDMA do? It increases the oxytocin levels in the body, which is the, what goes back and forth between the mom and the child. It also increases the uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, and it decreases the amygdala activity. So it increases, it increases the, the part that's suppressed with the PTSD symptoms, and also uh, it also dampens down the uh, activity in the amygdala, increases norepinephrine, which is good for learning, and increases the cortisol levels. And you know what? I can send anybody PowerPoints, so Doc, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, I'll send you my PowerPoints. Spread the word. So, MDMA may encourage people to respond to fears by connecting with others. It may not blunt it, but it may make one less threatened by it and able to move forward. And that's what we need as therapists. I do this for a living. You, if the client does the work and you can get them to move forward and get them more functioning, in a very short period of time, the, the, uh, it was statistically significant after three sessions. Okay, so this is not your typical pharmaceutical that you take every day, your SSRI, etc. Uh, LSD, which still has a bad rep in the United States because of Timothy Leary, for those of you that are around uh, back then. Uh, the research was just concluded in Switzerland, again using it uh, at, for terminal patients, people that had advanced end-stage cancer. Uh, the smart thing that we're doing now is that the research results will be accepted in the U.S. so that we can, we can petition uh, the uh, FDA to allow uh, to allow research in the United States using it. So even if we don't have the research here, we can use the research results to try to get it here. So as Rick Dablin says, this is the culmination of the first phase of the psychedelic renaissance. So we've come that far that we can talk about it. It will happen in the next 10 years. Uh, psilocybin is being used to treat, somebody asked me about this earlier, to treat uh, the, the dying. This is at uh, UCLA terminal cancer patients. Uh, basically the focus giving people a trip like this is to look to reduce anxiety and depression uh, and to kind of focus on having a good death. Something that uh, is not 
uh, possible when you medicalize death and have people being opiated and not conscious. So here is something where you dose people with a heroic dose of a psychedelic and allow them to, to have their own experience about their death. Uh, so what did they find with this research? It was safe, both uh, physiologically and psychologically, no clinically adverse uh, problems, no bad effects. There was a reduction in anxiety from one to three months after treatment with an improvement of mood that improved up to the six months. So this is you know, pretty significant to think that this ex experience could impact the uh, mood up to six months later. And this is just the initial research that is happening now. So just one, one dose, mm -hmm. one, you know, yes. three, wow. Right. It's, uh, the, uh, I, I don't have the video, but Pam Sakuda is one of the more famous uh, ones. She's since deceased, and uh, she had two sessions, one with a placebo, one without, and basically it changed her perspective on dying, and I talked to her husband, and she went down with the, with the uh, ship, as you like to say. So uh, they were recruiting uh, participants here, uh, more research, but this time it's on early cancer patients. So it's not just terminal, because what has happened with psychedelics is we've had to start with the terminal end and move toward the middle, if you get what I'm saying. Because that way, it, you, you can't argue with it. <clears throat> Outcome measures, again, an improvement in life, anxiety, attitude about death, use of pain medication, people die less having to be less opiated because they're all more emotionally attuned to the upcoming event, right? <coughs> At Johns Hopkins, they're also, again, like I said, we're moving toward the middle here, looking to see if psilocybin along with uh, a cognitive behavioral treatment approach could uh, be useful in helping people stop smoking. So using mushrooms to help you stop smoking. Huh. Why not? Uh, at, at New York University, uh, research being done, same thing, psilocybin, end of life. Uh, these people were hallucinogen naive, they had not used psychedelics for the most part. Uh, the results initially are uh, ex experienced clinical improvement, reported reduction, resolution of death anxiety. Psychedelics has been called an existential medicine. This is something that is very much about uh, bringing you into the moment. This is what the uh, advertisement looked like for when they were doing the research on psilocybin. Seeking people committed to spiritual development to participate in a study of mystical experience. And you can see here that uh, it would appeal probably to some of you in this crowd. Uh, what happens using psilocybin? The functional magnetic imaging uh, shows that it brings up robust activities of autobiographical memories in that part of the brain. So this could be useful for bringing up memories of the past uh, to work on in therapy. Uh, MDMA research has been approved in Canada. Uh, psilocybin pilot is being worked on this to be used to study in treating alcoholics. This will be very significant because we knew back in the 60s psychedelics are good for treating alcoholics. Bill Wilson knew it and stop. So this will be the first study if approved to use classical hallucinogens to treat alcoholism. MAPS is looking to develop a protocol to use MDMA to treat Asperger's syndrome. If you know the characteristics of Asperger's, uh, MDMA could, in, could engender perhaps empathy in the, in the clients that have Asperger's and be helpful. Uh, Mike Midhoffer, the gentleman that's doing the initial research on PTSD and MDMA, has expanded the study. He wants to focus also on first responders, firemen and policemen that are exposed to situations that uh, uh, could result in PTSD. And the significance about this will be he's going to see what protocol gives you relief. It might be as few as two. So as few as two sessions, usually three to five weeks apart, might give you relief from something that affects people for their lifetimes. So I don't know if anyone has any reactions on that, but that's pretty powerful to me. So what happens in psychedelic psychotherapy? Like anything else, it's a preparation. You've got to get the therapeutic alliance with your client um, and educate the client about what's about to happen. And then the ingestion of the psychedelic, the choice of the psychedelic and the dose. And then what happens? You have the uh, effect of the vast changes in perception, 
hopefully a catalyst for change and then finally after that making sense of what happened here so this is very very structured and then uh, the implementation of the experience um, the suggestion here is you might need booster experiences like you would need from you know in a therapeutic arrangement uh, if you're starting to have symptoms again so that would not be unusual and what Houston Smith says it is in the end it's altered traits not altered states we're looking to uh, change people's uh, personality traits using the insights gained under psychedelics. So here is what I call the, the transpersonal approach to addiction. Addiction is a response to life experience. It's not simply a drug. It, is, it can be considered an adaptogen. People do drugs, you're drinking caffeine, whatever it is that you do to make yourself feel better is a normal, natural thing. So that's an experience. It's not just simply about the drug. Uh, the standard experience, the experiments, the research done when the tide shifted on using psychedelics for treatment was to put a rat in a cage, a little cage, give it a heroin bottle with a little pull thing, and then what happens? The rat's bored out of its mind. It gets addicted to heroin. It won't have sex with, with rats, other rats, and it dies. So here's the conclusion. This is your brain on drugs. All drugs are bad and you're gonna die, right? So along comes uh, Bruce Alexander, I'm partial to a guy's name, Bruce, and uh, what he did is he took the rat environment and he made it 200 times the size of the standard cage. Put rats in there of opposite sex, put little rat toys in there, have a little rat diorama in the background, and what happened? He couldn't get the rats to addict to heroin. So, uh, and then he takes it a step further in globalization of addiction. Uh, basically, a society like we have sets the stage for addiction because it's a free market society. Got to have more and more and more. So it kind of sets the stage for addiction. It encourages kind of addictive habits and pursuit. You can never have enough of anything that feels good. What, what happened with the term addiction is that initially it didn't, wasn't used in a moralistic sense and it wasn't linked to alcohol or drugs. It originally meant it's surrendering to, uh, to a, uh, something that you're doing or to a master, state of being self-addicted to a habit or pursuit. But then around the time of the temperance movement, addiction indicated moral failure and the medical profession started using it as a term of it as a disease. So addiction changed and then here we are now. Drug addiction is an individual problem. It's progressive and relapsing. It's not curable. Can only be controlled by a professional intervention. Drug plus person always equals addiction and implies addiction is, a, is strictly a drug problem, which kind of misses the boat. Um, by viewing addiction as a character flaw and placing the emphasis on the drugs here, it reinforces that which probably most of you realize in this room uh, the war on drugs is an abysmal failure of money and time, uh, and it doesn't work. But this idea of addiction fuels that. So, so again, keep in mind that addiction is usually adaptive for the uh, addict. So it may not be a natural state, addiction, but the brain subverts it. And the part that it subverts is actually part of our central machinery of survival. So it kind of takes over. So I want to give you a little bit of insight into addiction. <clears throat> There's not any single apparatus involved in it, there's actually four. Uh, the first is an opioid apparatus, which always consummates in reward seeking, and then the dopamine system, which reinforces it. The self-regulation system that gets you to be able to control your use, and then the stress response mechanism, which kind of pumps that. The opioid apparatus is, is better known as the endorphins. So the endorphins, which are your own natural opiates, so your body is, you may realize or not realize, it actually has correlates of what I'm talking about in your body naturally. So they're the catalyst to events in our life. Uh, and what turns out is that both endorphins and plant opioids uh, are powerful soothers of both physical and mental pain. Uh, the endorphins are the emotional bond between the mother and the infant. Uh, they establish that. Uh, a loving response, you've got to understand how this works. A loving response from the, from the parents floods the brain with endorphins. Uh, children that don't receive this have start seeking external chemical satisfaction. 
So if they don't get their needs met as their brain is developing, they start craving this, uh, and if they can't get it from within, they start looking for it from without. So the brain undergoes the most critical development in the first 36 months. Uh, the opioid part of the apparatus is the entry point for narcotic substances within our brain. And not surprisingly, the less effective our own internal happiness system is, the more we look to the, to the outside to make ourselves happy. So if your internal chemical happiness system is flawed, you start seeking that which makes up for it. Uh, dopamine is what initiates reward seeking activities and sets off the repeat of the, uh, of the cycle. Environmental cues trigger dopamine release. So even thinking about the use of what it is you have a problem with starts releasing dopamine to get you uh, in the groove for it. So it's most active during the initiation and the establishment of addictive behaviors. <clears throat> uh, the self-regulation system um, ends up with repeated drug use kind of impacting it long term, changes uh, in the brain that undermine voluntary control, and then what happens is when the brain's impaired, there's a predictable pattern of impaired decision making, and then diminished impulse regulation results, so you're unable to regulate it. And this takes place uh, in the cortex found near the eye socket, regulates emotion, looks at how we react behaviorally to emotion, and that also participates in substance dependence. When this becomes impaired, the addicts are tricked into valuing false wants above real needs. So it's like now all their, need, all, their, um, all their wants have been reduced to one thing, and that's just to get the substance they have an addiction to. So if you've got a lot of problems, after you have an addiction, you just have one. Where to get it? So the, it's all about stimulus, whether it's good or bad. Stimulus wires the brain circuitry. Thank you. Uh, as the child develops and it can be provided by stimulus can be provided by addictive drugs or it could be provided or not provided by a lack of good stimulation. <laughs> Rat Park uh, research by Bruce Alexander showed that rats that had natural reinforcers were less likely to become addicted to heroin. So emotional nurturing is a natural reinforcer. It's very essential to the optimal uh, brain development. So the human connection is very important in the hormonal connections uh, as the brain evolves. And also uh, in addiction, because the brain is experience dependent. Uh, if there's an absence of good experiences or presence of bad experience, uh, this impacts the person uh, very dramatically. And how does it do that? Different experiences uh, can impact the brain. Uh, reducing ability to inhib inhibit self-destructive behaviors. Brain, the uh, drugs then take the place of missing human connections uh, in stimulus-restricted environments. Think Rat Park. Think that this is what puts the onus on society to fix the problem, not to interdict people, to put 2.5 billion people in jail and one out of every 31 Americans, mostly because of the war on drugs. We are a nation that warehouses people for profit. I heard you talk about that with the agent. We have that in my field of mental illness, and we have the prison system we have for-profit prisons that will, that will warehouse people for profit. And that's what it's turning to, and that's unfortunate. Slavery, modern-day slavery. Yes. So stress and trauma also can, uh, can impact the developing brain. It makes it more easily triggered for a stress response. And then what happens is the brain is reset and assigned a high value, the brain then assigns a high value to substances that provides short-term relief, right? So you're stressed, the brain is, is wired, it's like, what can I, it's very efficient, what can I get relief using? It's like, well, here it is, drugs, an addiction. So it's basically a deeply ingrained response to stress, using it to self-soothe, to cope. Uh, while pregnant, the mothers of the in maternal environment can send cortisol across the placenta, which also can program a predisposition toward addiction. Uh, dopamine receptors in the nucleus accumbens, this is part of the uh, reinforcing part of uh, addiction, is depleted. And again, the, the fact that you start craving uh, dopamine releasing substances, and then whatever best releases it as quickly as possible becomes the result and object of the uh, pursuit. 
So here's my question, and the question we asked many decades ago. Is it possible to provide a corrective experience for the addict that could be a new template going forward? Uh, past research decades ago on LSD as, a, as an adjunct to treating alcoholics suggests it's possible. Uh, at the second international conference on the use of LSD in 1965, for papers submitted from all over the world, some of them were financed by the CIA. This is back when the government was, was dosing people with psychedelics without them knowing. The good old times. Yeah. Uh, so the results indicated that the best predictor of abstinence is the transcendental experience facilitated by LSD. So this is not, this is you know, what AA is talking about. So LS, it's not LSD itself, it's the experience facilitated by LSD that made the person stop using. Patients felt like their life had value and meaning. Some felt as if they had been reborn and were able to reconstruct their own self-image. Uh, patients gain insight into their maladaptive behavior, values are, are conflict. Hallucinogens uh, have been used in religious ceremonies and also uh, as adjuncts to cure uh, alcoholism. Peyote, the uh, peyote ceremony is considered an intervention by the Indian Department of Human Services for treating alcoholism. And it works. A recent meta-analysis of of uh, single dose LSD treatments. Now here, bear in mind, this is single dose, one single dose of LSD, meta-analysis. 59% of the people had were improved versus 38%, one dose. Significant treatment effects up to six months, but not 12. Again, this suggests a need for repeated dosing. So the question is, can a psychedelic experience provide insight and help fill that spiritual emotional void that previously manifested itself as an addictive behavior? People get religious experiences and stop. What if you can reliably induce a mystical experience that caused them to stop using? Natural sources of psychedelic drugs have been used in religious ceremonies for millennia. Uh, when psychoactive drugs induce uh, temporary and reversible altered states in a supportive environment, you could end up with a experience that could be interpreted as very deeply religious uh, and spiritual. The thing that we have found out, because even though the research stopped in their labs, it never stopped in the street. LSD use has continued. All these decades, people just have figured out how to use it. Some of you are nodding your head. Uh, okay, so in higher doses, uh, the psychedelics facilitate recognition of the individual's relationships with all things, so you're out there on a high dose. On a moderate dose, it facilitates intricate awareness of the psychodynamic structures of your own individual consciousness. And on a lower dose, it facilitates awareness of solutions to technical and artistic problems. Some of the early research gave low dose psychedelics uh, to people. They were able to solve problems better. Steve Jobs did us all a favor by saying LSD was one of the most important things he did in his life. So how can you help clients survive a spiritual, potentially psychedelic experience? You know, for those of you that are in the addiction thing, in the addiction field, they don't really teach you how to do it the right way, you know, from anything I've seen. Uh, we're talking about symptoms of a bad trip. Uh, the client's unable to integrate the experience successfully. That's known as flashbacks. I have flashbacks from my first marriage, okay? It's, you don't have to have a drug to have a flashback. That's unresolved material. So you've got this feeling of fragmentation, disassociation, could be, could be likened to a psychotic break, uh, feelings of anxiety, paranoia, uh, and delusions of reference, and sometimes suicidal ideation because the person feels the experience not going to end. So what I'm going to talk about, I'm the guy that gets the calls from the psychedelic community. I go out a couple of times a year and go see some kid who spent the weekend doing way too many drugs at a party that shouldn't have, and now everybody's worried. So, a little advice. Uh, this is a quote from one of the uh, kids that I was working with. It said, the toughest thing is the depersonalization. It's hard to operate in your life when you feel like you're walking around dead. That's what it felt like. And this is after a weekend of ingesting whatever he'd get his hands on. Many religious systems have started based on a spiritual crisis, so it's not unusual. These sort of things that happen uh, are not unusual. 
So it's important to convey to the person that's experiencing this crisis that this is special, it's important, but it's not so unusual. Uh, and then they have this experience in the context of their, of their framework from which they're raised. Uh, oftentimes it's spiritual, because that's where it kind of kicks into that part of the brain. So as mental health workers, you have to be, con you have to be careful that your conceptual framework is not judging of people that have had these experiences, and you shouldn't impose any kind of framework on them. When I, was, when I was first getting into the field, I worked with the mostly disturbed kids, and at one of the meetings we went to, the other uh, therapists were talking about the nonsense they were telling kids happened to their brains when they were on drugs. And I said, obviously nobody in this room has done drugs, because that is the worst thing you tell a kid to do, because when he does it, he's going to think his brain is bleeding. That is hugely unethical. So um, you, have to, you have to make the person realize that it's a short-term thing, they're going to come down. Use the symptoms as an opportunity for healing, not indications of a disease. The last thing I would tell somebody that I went out to see was, God, you shouldn't have done that. You probably fried your brains out. Right? Because that's going to set the stage for uh, not a good story. So you have to create a safe and supportive context for this uh, deep personal transformation. So the general guidelines to keep in mind if you're, if you're working with people is that the context of the experience needs to be acknowledged, not denied. You have to see how the person links this back to their life experience uh, to help the person calm down and remind them that this, this state is time limited. This will end. The drug does wear off, and then it's over. That's what you have to tell them. So where do we go from here? Should we pursue psychedelic research? Why not? Uh, it's got a very respectable history that only uh, changed because of the uh, scheduling of, of substances in 1970. Uh, just about everything I've talked about other than ketamine is a Schedule One. Uh, also, this idea that a single state point of view doesn't incorporate other mind-body states. Uh, and the only consciousness that is of any value, according to our society, is the one we have right now. Uh, so this also has potential to treat intractable diseases that I've mentioned, uh, serotonergic hallucinogens, stop cluster headaches in sub-threshold doses. If you know anyone that has a head cluster headache, doing sub-threshold doses of mushrooms that can be grown in your basement, I'm not suggesting you do it, stops cluster headaches. And I'll be speaking at the Cluster Buster Conference this year in Chicago, in Rosemont, I believe it is. Uh, Bob Wold, who founded it, tells people how to go about growing their own mushrooms so they would stop the cluster headaches and not take the medicine that destroys their body, doesn't relieve the cluster headaches. People commit suicide from that. So. You have to look at the harm caused by drugs. Uh, this just came out, this is Drug Harms in the United K, just came out this year, published in The Lancet. Uh, basically, they rated the drugs on a scale of 100, uh, including harm to others and harm to self. Uh, alcohol, not surprisingly, way over 70 out of 100. Heroin, up there too. Crack cocaine. Methamphetamine is up between uh, you know, 35. Cocaine, uh, tobacco. Amphetamine, uh, cannabis is up in here because it is still against the law for the most part. So this takes into account the harm that it causes the user, incarceration and so forth. But you can see that what I'm talking about here, ecstasy, LSD, mushrooms, way down, way down. Yet, alcohol and tobacco are not scheduled. They're not scheduled. They kill more people than anything combined that I've been talking about. It's the money. Makes no sense. Well, a way to look at uh, safety of drugs is to, is to compare the effective dose when you first start to feel it to the lethal dose. Marijuana, there's no lethal dose. You can't do enough marijuana to kill yourself. Again, I'm not suggesting you do marijuana, but I'm saying you can't do enough to kill yourself. LSD and psilocybin, a thousand to one ratio. Right? Um, still in 24, codeine, some surprising stuff here. A uh, 21 ratio MDMA, uh, not something to be taken lightly. Uh, cocaine, alcohol, 10 to 1. Uh, nutmeg, uh, something that's used in prisons uh, to get people high. Uh, 7 to 1 ratio in heroin. 
So again, you see that what I'm talking about is on top of the schedule here. Very safe. So uh, Roger, Roger Walsh uh, feels that there's four reasons why psychedelics are not considered viable for mind enhancement. And we still have this bias against psychedelics. Uh, is this a lack of evidence? Uh, thousands of studies done before the early 70s, current research since the early 90s continues. There's no problems. Risks, there are risks if used unskillfully. I'm talking about the controlled use of psychedelics in a, in a controlled setting. In well-screened, prepared, supervised, and follow-up uh, psychiatric patients taking pure psychedelic drugs, again, not street drugs, not ecstasy, but pharmaceutical MDMA, there's a difference. The incidence of severe adverse reactions is less than 1%. And in even normal, in even less in uh, normal volunteers. Cultural misunderstandings, dangers are sensationalized. The stories about people staring up at the sun and burning the retinas of their eye. Not true. Not true. Okay. But good sensationalism sells newspapers, magazines. Uh, transient benefits. Only research can provide the answers. So psychedelic research is basically about altered states of consciousness, which is not recognized by the West, by Western society. Uh, it could be considered self-indulgent, uh, escapist, and maybe even a symptom of mental illness. Uh, our psychiatry is biased in two ways, both ethnocentric. So what doesn't make sense to a psychiatrist is either superstitious or psychotic. It's like, I, I don't understand it, so either it's magical or you're crazy. Uh, the cognocentric, only the ordinary states of consciousness are of value. Anything other than that is not. So other issues with it is uh, obviously uh, the, the association with the counterculture movement in the 60s and the 70s, the you know, anti-Vietnam uh, people uh, against the war, questioning of accepted beliefs. This association that may have been created by the government as the stuff got out on the street uh, and became the association. So what is needed then is an approach that sees altered states as a legitimate mind-body state and then use the shift of, of paradigm that happens under this to change old learning patterns. LSD psychotherapy can turn you on a dime. It could take years to do it in psychotherapy, but in a couple, you know, in a couple hours of a, of a heroic dose, you may get enough insight into that to change what you're doing. I would say about 350 micrograms, about three and a half, four hits. Uh, they were using up, you know, up to even a thousand, you know. So Western religion is more about a belief system than an experiential one. Uh, Jung said one of the functions of mainstream religions is to protect people against direct experience of God. The, the saying is the, the uh, white man goes into the church and prays to God, and the Indian goes into the teepee and talks to God on peyote, right? So there's the difference. Uh, whereas ancient technologies of the sacred uh, included altered states as a way to uh, lead to mental health and healthy personality development. So in psych when using psychedelic research, we can reliably test this. We can reliably induce altered states of consciousness. So I, I conclude that psychedelics can be positive, a positive influence. It can impact in a bio, psycho, social, spiritual domain. Uh, when we say bio, we're talking about influencing the uh, physical well-being, psycho, the thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. Uh, socially, it can enhance your interpersonal cohesion, help you to reintegrate back into the community and environment. And spiritually, it can enhance spiritual orientation. Uh, many of the research subjects, when they were uh, after the uh, after the session using psychedelics, became very much became much more spiritual. So, that is the end of my presentation. I welcome any questions from the audience. I'm also shamelessly plugging, I teach a class on psychedelics at College of DuPage, one of the few offered in this country. I'm teaching it this summer, face to face. I call it the summer of love. Okay, so if anybody wants some love, you can want to take the class. I also teach it online, which is interesting because anybody in the country can take it including, you know, uh, I get a lot of social workers, uh, stoners, uh, and so forth, but we're talking about the science of psychedelics.
And I do that. Uh, it's allowed me to be able to make presentations like this all over the country without being arrested. All right. The first question was Laura Sonkin. Yeah, okay. So um, how are you actively doing research? Not, my, not myself. I'm only a master's level, but I'm supporting it. I'm spreading the word. I'm talking about it. So they would have to get um, a special, um, you know, like where do you get... Uh, you know, this quality of the LSD, you have to apply to the yes. CDC? Yeah, you, it, it's, very, it's very regulated and it has to be approved by the FDA. But there, there is research being done at the University of Chicago now on psychedelics. I'm sorry? Is that the love dose? Is that the love dose? I'm not sure what the love dose is. Hmm? The heroic love dose. The heroic love dose. Uh, so it's only being done in the... In a, in a laboratory setting, right. Because it's all Schedule One. Uh, ketamine is not, and that is the only thing that I found out is somebody is actually doing sessions of it legally. And he is a psychiatrist. So. Hi, Chris Green. Yes. Um, so one thing I would like to just challenge the harm value. I know specifically that you discussed cannabis versus psychedelics. Mm -hmm. um, I think cannabis is a little bit Do you need change, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I, Dave, can I take I your card? Yes, I think it's a little bit different. I'll tell you what you just made. The of psychedelic is a felony offense. Um, and I don't think it's widely used for this kind of thing. Um, secondly, I, I don't deny that using psychedelics can you know, in some ways your therapist should be more receptive to the therapist. But with that said, the man is often still being a heightened state of being, you know, the more, you know, in touch with the emotions, the more receptive to what you're saying. But how a drug is a drug. But, but let, me, let me just say one thing. It's, it's not receptive what I'm saying. So what's not happening is I don't give you the MDMA and then you wait for me to tell you some amazing stuff. What happens is you sit back with head shades, iPhones, iPhones, head shades, uh, eye shades and headphones, okay? And you do the work yourself. Questions first, rebuttal later. Yeah. Questions first. You'll have a chance to rebut at the end. At, at, at they the they have their protocol. Okay. Uh, so no, I'll take questions. Oh. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yes, uh, Joe Mayer. Uh, has any research been done on acknowledged uh, psychopaths or sociopaths? No, not lately. I mean, it might, there might be some potential. I seem to recall something done a long time ago. I mean, again. The hope would be something like an empathogen would be helpful, you know, but no. I mean, it, it, this is, I mean, the genie has gotten out of the bottle a little bit, and it's so, I mean, I've met the researchers. They are, like, they have to jump through a lot of hoops. They have to have a lot of endurance just to get their thing improved. It has, they count it, they weigh it, they, it has to be in a safe, you know, an arm, you know, I mean, it's just, because they're so afraid it's going to get out. It's been out. It's never going back in the bottle, so they're wasting their time on that, but... Uh, so yeah, I might have some potential. Uh, Wes Weiger. Uh, what, what do you think of the uh, Native American church? Are they still out there? Yes, uh, I did a Native American church ceremony a couple years ago, uh, legally, uh, ingesting peyote. Uh, what do I think of it? The service I went to was very rigorous. Uh, nobody goes there to trip. Uh, it lasted all night with a lot of purging a lot of singing, a lot of sermons. Uh, so that is permitted by the United States as part of the Religious Freedom Act. Also, ayahuasca is permitted. Uh, the heir to the Seagram's throne, you know, the alcohol, uh, is a ordained minister in the, in the ayahuasca church, and he brought it back to the United States. So there are two psychedelic drugs that are permitted to be used in a religious context in the United States as part of the ceremony. So again, this is a structured environment, you're not taking it out of the environment, and it is permitted by, uh, to use religiously. Any churches here in Chicago? Probably, but they're probably underground. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, you're talking about using these drugs with people who have suffered childhood abuse or something like that. 
But I think that, you know, all the time people are always talking about, well, who, who made what up? I mean, if you're using a psychedelic drug, you, you have access to other ideas than what actually happened to you. See, but nobody's putting ideas in your head either. You're doing the work yourself. And it's accessing parts of your brain, of your memory. Supposedly, it still doesn't mean that it's a true thing that happened. Well, it might be something that, that, that you feel. I'm not saying that. Miranda? I don't know about that. I mean, people that that have been have had that experience in the context that I'm talking about have been very well uh, prepared for that, and they're not hallucinating things that are attributing things magically to. They're actually doing the work that they do in therapy. It's just accelerated. I mean, you could say the same thing about therapy. That's why I'm saying it's not because one of the things they found out is that, that the client could be responding to the therapist, but this work is done by the client internally. These are people that you know, so. You know, I don't know. How do you guide it? How do you, you guide it like, like you would guide somebody in, like a, as a sitter. You just sit there. They have, obviously, if they need, they'll have benzos if they need to abort the trip. But for the most part, you, the, the client is doing the work themselves. They've had a lot of preparation for it. And then they do the internal work. And then whenever they get stuck, they, the therapist is there, and they work through it immediately and just keep proceeding. Yes. All right, David. Um, how, was how close is, you know, Groff, Stan Laskin Groff? He did because the, he couldn't do LSD anymore, so he did this in the how, breathing. Holotropic breathing. The holotropic breathing. Yes. And I experienced it. How close is that to, or is there any research to actually ingesting? Uh, a psychedelic. Yeah, I don't think there's any research, but he himself, as you uh, aptly pointed out, developed halotropic breathing, which is a way of hyperventilating and changing the uh, chemical mixture, the air, and uh, you know the oxygen and, and the dioxide, and then it, uh, people end up having an altered. They'll have an altered state. They'll go into an altered state, and the breathing is uh, the, you, it. It mirrors music, and it keeps getting faster. And then people just end up having psychedelic experience. It's not been research that I know, but he, that was his way of coming up with a non-psychedelic way to, to do that. David Zucker and then Charles Pitta. Yes. Now, the head of the church that you just spoke of, is he a member of the Bronfman family? Yes. They sold signals a long time ago. Well, he still had the money. I'm just saying, the point is that he had the money to fight to take it up to the Supreme Court. That's the key thing. Because when he when he came back up here, they confiscated the ayahuasca, which is DMT, at the border. But he had the money to fight it, probably because of what he said. So as, as the heir to the to the throne that was sold, he bought it up and and, he, and they won, as well they should. As having gone to a ceremony, believe me, there's no, you know nobody's taking nobody's taking peyote and going off and you know it's, it's not like that. Hey Charles. Yeah, Bruce. There's implication in your program that people who have a direct experience of God are normal and fine and so forth. I mean, if I go around saying I'm talking to my angel friends, you know, I'm sorry, these people are far from I where it's classified as normal. I mean, you have Muhammad up there communicating. You are missing so much, Charles, in your life. I'm telling you. I mean, and then you're, you're, you're advancing this that I will have a direct experience to God. As you could. As an atheist, I don't know if I'm going to do any now. Well, if you, then it could be called whatever you wanted. Well, what you said is nothing new. Right. You could be whatever you want it to be. Well, I'm serious. I'm really what does religious faith have to do with being a normal human being? Well, it In they, fact, the normal human being isn't these extreme religious factors. Well, that's, that's quite a continuum. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I would suggest if you ever get an opportunity to see one of the ceremonies, you'd see what I'm talking about. It's yeah. that's ritual. No, no it's nothing. Needs nothing. Either. That's it. I okay. see really ritual all the time.
Um, um, Al, can I answer this? Charles, you know in AA that uh, oftentimes they'll have a uh, kind of a spiritual awakening, and that is a, an indication that they might be recovering from their alcoholism, or at least being able to manage it in their life a little bit better, right? You, that's common knowledge, right? Started no. as not all of them, but it's a very common thing. So it's it's a spiritual experience. Well, it, and it's subjective. I mean, so so the fact that you're an atheist, it'd be interesting to see what kind of trip you would have. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Actually, yes. Two real quick. Can I get that? Yeah. Can you, me, uh, can you send me a PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. And number two, I mentioned to some of my coworkers, and you're aware of okay. what they might be. Um, about that I was coming here and I told them a little bit what this was going to be about. Uh, and they were all kind of, oh, no, 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 that ain't right. Well, and if, where can I get the information about Bill Wilson? Uh, it's, it's in the book. It's, it's, I mean, I can get you, just email me. It's, okay. it's in the book. I mean, okay. he talks about it. I mean, they, they don't talk about it, but we are now. Yeah, I sure in the heck am. You mean like the big book? Yeah, the big book. Okay. And just, just a real quick reminder that this will be, uh, this whole lecture will be online in about three days after I post it. So anything yeah. that's here, and uh, I too have his presentation, so with his permission, I can yeah, also email absolutely. it. Okay. Spread the word. All right, Richard Lang. Oh, you were waving your hand. Uh, let's see, uh, yes, Doug. Uh, yeah, what kind of mushrooms are effective against cluster headaches? Oh, uh, the, the serotonergic, the psilocybin, magic mushrooms. Go to Cluster Busters, Google Cluster Busters. Just ask for shrooms on the street, you'll get them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but by the way, they're also working on a non-psychoactive version of it that, that will, hopefully will be effective. And the uh, originator of Cluster Busters is not, does not want to trip, so he does sub-threshold doses. So Gene Harker. Uh, al alcohol and uh, tobacco are are legal. They're taxed and they're controlled. Should we do the same thing to other drugs? I don't see why not. Thank you. Yes. So if I want to partake in one of these things, do I go to oh, the? I'm sorry. If I want to partake in one of these things, where do I go? Do I go to the University of Chicago? Yeah, look it up. Look it up. Okay. Do you know who the person, the researcher is? The researcher, the researcher is Harriet the DeWitt. The DeWitt, D-E-W-I-T-T -T lab. So, my question is actually a question. Um, so we've discussed the experiences during the therapeutic sessions. What are the experiences of what the experiences of what is 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 the experiences of so we've discussed the experiences, the enlightenments that they've had during, you know, experiences while they're on psychedelic treatment, you know, with the actual therapist, but what are the implications on the side of treatment in their daily lives that they learn from that experience? Secondly, <coughs> is there a risk, you know, when you have this enlightenment, you know, you have this field good factor because you've gotten this increased enlightenment throughout that session. Is there a risk of habit forming behavior constantly wanting to get this enlightened state of mind? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the uh, classical hallucinogens are not something you could repeat every day. You couldn't do LSD two days in a row and get the same effect. So most experts will tell you that LSD and psilocybin are not something you would habituate to. It just it just doesn't. MDMA may be a different story, right? So so there is that risk, I would say, potentially with MDMA, but with LSD and psilocybin, no. And then secondly, what we're what we're looking for is that what you learned about yourself, that maybe you were able to connect dots in your life that you were unable to, that when you came down to ground level, we you were water? able to sure. that would alter the way you are behaving, the way you're thinking. So the idea is is, is like Houston Smith said, it's altered traits, not the states. So it's, it's, it's all about how you integrate that back into your life. 
So part of part of it will be a therapeutic aftercare. Now, with that being said, would there be like a journal, some kind of audio taping, or sort of reference that you can use to kind of help them reflect on the moment? That well, I think it would depend on the individual protocols. I mean, right now it's all has to follow a protocol that's research oriented. So I'm sure it's documented up to yin yang, you know. But uh, when it becomes part of, uh, as Rick Doblin says, when it'll be offered in clinics, that remains to be seen. But hopefully, it, it, you know, they're saying maybe 10 years. Okay, Don Davis. Yes. Would you call alcohol a psychedelic drug? I would call alcohol a consciousness contracting drug. What I'm talking about is consciousness expanding drugs. Alcohol is a consciousness contracting drug. No, I would not. I mean, I like a good drink, but it's not very psychedelic to me. What got you interested in this uh, field of study, and why are you so passionate about it? Uh, you know what is, uh, I reinterested myself in this field, being a student of the 60s, okay? Uh, my mother was dying of cancer, and she was so anxious for seven years to die of colon cancer. I watched her, the anxiety, the operations, the chemo, and I thought, and I wrote my master's thesis, I was going for my master's degree in clinical psychology, dedicated it to her as she was dying, she lived long enough to see it. So it was, I, I, you, you write and you picked up on it, I have this passion because there is no reason why we shouldn't help people that are suffering. I've, I've shown you there's no good scientific reason, there is no safety reason not to use this in a controlled setting. So, I mean, it, you know, maybe just in time for my own death. But that's why I'm, I'm on this mission, uh, and are most people that are, uh, you know, if so inclined, realize that uh, you can help people very quickly. I mean, when somebody has six months left to live, how are you going to, what are you going to do, you know? But give somebody a, an, a, an experience, and then allow them to be there with their families, and all of a sudden it's a lot easier. David Travis? Ah! Would, you, it, would it be better to uh, smoke marijuana in a carburetor or a bong? Well, that's not really what this lecture is about. <laughs> you might ask some of the individuals here that might know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, so I have you actually done this uh, in research with dying patients? No, not myself, but I mean, I when I uh, started writing my thesis, I met with Rick Doblin. That's how I got to know him pretty well, and uh, so I, I had access to, at that time, you know, I had to do the research, like going to the libraries, but now I can do it online. So I've, I've not, you know, I've not been there when people have had that, but um, I have a pretty good idea of how it would work. Did they, did they have... Um did they have like uh, precognition maybe of their death, or did they have, you know, can you tell us some of the... You mean what, what their experiences were? Well, uh, you know, the, the one that, um, and, and I can send this link, uh, if you look up Pam Sakuda, basically what she talks about in the experience is in her trip, she experienced what would happen to her husband after her death. So she saw it, she grieved, she cried, and then when she came back down to consensual reality, it was like, I don't know how much time I have left, but I got to spend it with this guy, my husband, you know. And so I talked to him about it, and he said, I alluded to it, that she went down with the ship because basically when people get a cancer diagnosis, they start to check out. And the doctor tells you how long you have to live, like my mom. You know, you have a couple years to live, and there it is. You know, uh, have a good day. Right? So... What, kind, what are you going to do? You give them an SSRI, you know, give them a benzo or whatever, anxiolytic. So here you have, especially, we have started initially with people that were at the end stage, but an opportunity for somebody to, to kind of look at it from a third person point of view and experience what potentially could the rest of the family go through and kind of gives them an insight into how they should act so that after they're gone, it'll, it'll have a better, and it's always been, the, it's always been that way. The reports have, it's always been that good people have felt more religious, spiritually connected. Uh, you know, one of the hallmarks of a, of a heroic dose of, of, of uh, LSD and other psychedelics is a loss of ego-centered consciousness. So all of a sudden you're not that person that you are, that you see in the mirror, all of a sudden you're more a part of the universe in very, you know, kind of abstract terms. 
and that is very reassuring that you're not just, you know, a skin encapsulated ego, as, as Alan Watts says. Well, is there a Charles? Yeah, no, I let him go. Bruce, you keep using this term in, in a controlled setting. Uh, couldn't I say that the use of alcohol in a controlled setting is very beneficial to everyone? Couldn't yeah. I substitute? Yeah, I mean, there's been analogies of sitting in a bar is very much like therapy, or your bartender's your therapist. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I mean... Bartenders usually are good listeners. But people use these substances in other than controlled settings. Again, the difference I said, alcohol, consciousness contracting, you don't remember what you did after a certain number of drinks. With what I'm talking about, you most certainly remember what you were thinking. That's the difference. Got you there. Okay. Um, I don't know if you got me. Well, let's see. Uh, yes. Sorry. Matt. Bruce, I was wondering about stigma. I mean, we're talking about a, a lot of drugs that have 30, 40 years of stigma attached to them, and we're trying to do uh, research and therapy connected to those chemicals. What have they seen so far about? stigma attached to them, because it must be hard to try to do therapy with a, a substance that has so much history behind it. Well, that's a good point, because what I've come to find out, what do you think the biggest problem with psychedelic research is? Anybody know? Timothy Leary. Yes. Getting good stuff. No, it's finding finding participants. Yeah. Oh, here I am. Oh. <laughs> hey, we got some here in this room, I'm right. sure. Well, they, they, they believe the misinformation. And, you know, when I've talked to the psychedelic researchers, like, we're having a hard time finding participants because they think that they're going to go crazy. Psychotomimetic. Psychotomimetic. Mimic psychosis. You know what you're talking about, sir. Okay. Okay. I can accuse it worse. I was, I was a part of the studies that occur at the WIT lab and the MDMA studies and I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still doing my own profession, pursuing my own career. So here's and I was dosed three times. Yes. Right. And it was from the government. I mean, this was all. In. So I guess that's my point. Well, you know, going on with Matt was talking about, you know, there is a stigma with a lot of drugs. But you know, now that we're getting to the 21st century, you know, back in the early 20th century, 21st century, 20th century. You know, like they're finding marijuana to be more medicinal, you know, heroin and opiate drugs used for pain. So my question is, what is the correlation you feel between psychedelic treatment, you know, and the whole legal aspect of it? How do you feel that that's going to change? Will you see it going in 10 years? Um, yeah, that's my question. Okay, well, what the hope is that we would move psychedelics to a Schedule II like ketamine, at the very least, so that research wouldn't be impeded and you could actually, you could actually use it, because if you're a Schedule II like ketamine and cocaine, um, you, can use, uh, you can use that, you can be prescribed it. Now, here is, here is, here is the ironic thing. Uh, the, the plant is a Schedule I, so marijuana is a Schedule I, the synthetic is a schedule three. Yeah. So that makes no sense, okay? So the active ingredient of the plant, you can be prescribed by your doctor, but the plant is considered a narcotic. Oh, that's the, that's the FDA drug uh, right. you know, industry. So, so in the answer to your question, it, we would like to move it to a schedule two. Uh, people need to realize that the you know that the war on drugs, this whole thing needs to stop, and that it's impeding people with cluster headaches, people that are dying and have PTSD. Uh, I've been taught to be very careful about how you refer to things. Pharmaceutical MDMA is not ecstasy. It's not street ecstasy. It's pharmaceutical grade. The the people in the in the marijuana field say you say you refer to it as cannabis. Cannabis is medicine. Marijuana is was pejorative and was used around the turn of centuries to refer kind of off label to Hispanics, right? So they, it was this whole, you know, you tar you don't have to target 
the population, you target their drug of choice, and that's what the scheduling is. So make sure that people of color end up in jail disproportionately, and on and on and on. So the hope is that people will understand that what we're talking about is different than cocaine, methamphetamine. We're talking about things that could be beneficial to society, and that putting people in jail for these things, uh, the last guy that I know of that was convicted for um, selling and giving away LSD was Leonard Picard. He got three consecutive life sentences. He will never see the light of day. More than mass murderers. I mean, this guy got three consecutive life sentences. That's it. He's done. For selling? For, well, yeah. He was making it a missile silo in Kansas. He was not very um, on the down low. Well, uh, yes, uh, well, then how do you stop the uh, street use of these drugs when they are, in a sense, the... the uh, debilitating a lot of the youth of America today when they come in and things like this. Well, you stop putting them in prison and start giving us money in the social services. Start dealing with the problem at the root end. Start remembering things that Bruce Alexander said. Let's try to fix the society. Let's not have people live in environments where they have to do drugs because, you know, they live in rat-infested environments. I think that that's where the money needs to go. That's how you fix it. You don't put people, you don't warehouse people for profit. That never takes care of the problem. Is there any specific recommendations you would make on this? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would you know, tell your representatives to support mental health and, and uh, addictions, you know, addiction treatments. And, you know, we had, I think, the last count, 25 prisons in Illinois. I mean, you work at Sheridan, right? How many prisoners are in Sheridan? 2,000, and it's entirely substance abuse prisons. Yeah, so, I mean... What are we doing? We're warehousing people. They're not getting better. And when they come out, it's the same thing. They go back to the same environment. That's that's the whole theme of Rat Park. But nobody wants to hear that. I mean, that's part of my message too. You know, I'm in the social service field. We see the ravages. I've got some of my colleagues here. I'm not going to identify them because then you guys will be talking to them in the bathroom. But um, but you know, we should be getting money so we could be helping. You know, we know what to do. But putting people in jail. I mean. Exactly. So, you know, what we do, what social services does, costs the state a fraction of what prisons, nursing homes, and psych wards do. Nobody listens, nobody cares. We show it to them, I put it on the blackboard, we bring clients down and show them what it looks like. It doesn't make any difference. The pockets of the, you know, people that make decisions are being lined with the money from places like that. Let's go to uh, Bill Ovens? Oh, yeah. Do you uh, consider cannabis a it's considered a minor psychedelic. I mean, you can ingest it enough of it that it would be very hallucinogenic. So I would say it would be a minor one. Okay. Let's go to rebuttals. Uh, Charles, we will go to rebuttals. Um, Bruce, you said something there that I believe it. People become disturbed because they weren't nurtured the first 36 months That's fine. of their lives. How did you arrive at that? Did you ask to stir people? No, that's were their parents carrying it out and they told you no? Well, this has come from you know, research in the field. I, I don't have the specific research, but they have been studying the brain and what happens as as they develop, especially the first 36 months. And you can look at the brain of, of people that are not in nurturing environments and measure that. So, I mean, there, this is the science. This isn't, this isn't conjecture. What I'm presenting is the facts. Not just because my name is Bruce. I don't see how you arrive at facts. Well, I didn't arrive at it. I'm, I'm saying I'm, I am, I'm disseminating information that I've Got from I mean, you also had a thing in there that there's something in the womb. The, well. the stress can be passed across the placenta, and then and the and the uh, you know the growing baby is becomes sensitive to that most definitely. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. We will now move.
down to our infamous rebuttal the period. The infamous rebuttal period. Yeah. All right. Uh, how many people here okay, have uh, yeah. remarks to make the rest of us? Okay, thank you for that. All right, Rhonda. Excuse me. I have a line. Someone has a direct experience of God. My parents didn't know me. All right, we're going to rebut for five minutes each. Uh, you will be timed. I'll be watching in the back to take care of it, and uh, let's get the here's a here's a. Yeah. Okay. All right, our first uh, rebutter uh, is Joe Mayer, and I want to remind you that we have two rules here. The first is one pool at a time, the rest of us should listen to the pool, and uh, the second is uh, that we do not make hostile uh, invidious uh, remarks about the person of uh, anyone uh, uh, present or other parents. First of all, I would like to thank our speaker and his shirt for a very wonderful presentation. Um, I've been sort of a perpetual member of the control group in many experiments, and I'm not sure I'm happy with that. But that's why. Um, I've been to many, many astrophysical and physics conferences in the last 40 years. Um, never have I seen a conference begin like the introduction video here, but I certainly wish we had done that. I uh, thank the speaker. Uh, of course, my interest is social justice, so uh, I, at church we read uh, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, and I think this, you know, there's a huge racial element in this thing. We've got all these young men, young black men in jail, uh, wasting our taxpayers' money, and worse than that, wasting their lives. Uh, I don't understand this whole operation. Uh, we should get these folks out of jail, uh, give them something to do in their own communities, and, and, uh, and uh, these rich guys who are running these uh, prisons probably can find some other thing to do to get some money. Uh, thank the speaker. Um, okay, so I'm a family physician, and I'm here to tell you that uh, pot is safer than aspirin. But please, the, I think there was a little something wrong with your slide, and that is that smoking pot actually does cause a very high degree of uh, lung damage. The oils in pot are extremely uh, caustic and uh, can cause early emphysema and chronic obstructive lung disease. So eat your pot. Please, eat your pot from a doctor. That's what I'm asking you to do. Mm. Number two, um, I definitely think that the um, the prison, the drug to prison, you know, pipeline is uh, like this uh, century's form of slavery. I really do, and so I, it, it's an abomination. There's no question about it. We need to treat mental illness and treat uh, drug addiction. 
And the third thing is, is I've never tried ayahuasca, but I always have, and I've had a lot of friends who tried it in South America and in rituals. And it seems to be not only, yeah, I, there's something different about it. And I wanted to ask you that question, but I, there's something different about the experiences on ayahuasca that are even more transcendent, transcendent, right? Transcendent. Transcendental than, um, than regular hallucinogens. And so when you come back up, if you have any experience, I'd like that. Thanks. Well, I haven't been up here to comment for a long time. I've been coming to the College of Complexes most of the time since 1964. But now, maybe just once or twice a month. Everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know how long we're going to do here. But anyway, I basically believe that uh, all drugs should be legal and uh, in a clinic. Well, they belong and off the streets. Now, there's some drugs now they're finding out that none of the natural drugs. And the unnatural drugs, like that one that got out and somebody was eating the other man's face or something like that, you put have heard that on the news. Well, so, <laughs> I don't know about drugs like that. Well, anyway, I am an alcoholic, okay? And if I hadn't sobered up shortly when I did, I would have been dead many years ago or suffering from a wet brain, so-called, in a hospital. All right. Now, a lot of people don't understand what, what alcoholism is definitely an addiction, at least for me. And after I, I first started drinking, I blacked out. And from then on, I usually blacked out every time I drink. Now, blackout's not a passion. You know what you're doing in a blackout, otherwise you couldn't do it. The last car I had was 50, 1949 Ford, okay. and uh, 1955 I ran into a light pole coming from Cicero. I had no idea of getting in the car. I had no IDs on me, no, no uh, driver's license, but I didn't get cut through all the green poles, you know. And uh, now, there might be a little miscommunication here. If you mention about AA, you know, mention some of this that they're working on. AA has no opinions of outside, uh, AA I mean, has no opinions on outside issues, none whatsoever. It's a 12-step program uh, to, to stay away from the first drink. Whenever I picked up one drink, I blacked out, and uh, from then on, I don't know what I did half of the time. I could be here all night telling you the bad stuff. I'm getting out of jail all the time, got beat up all the time, barred for every place. Today, most people say, Don, why don't you come around a little more? We don't see you much anymore. And I, when I got kicked out, they say, don't come back. And they, they say, come back, you know. And, uh, well, anyway, I just wanted to get back to it, but it, it, you're not the only one. There's a lot of them that say AA has this opinion and that, but AA has alcohol phenomenon and has no opinion on outside issues. Okay, now I'm an addictive person. There's other things I get addicted to also. Matter of fact, I think I was addicted to the, to the College of Complex at one time. <laughs> I went every Saturday for years. I've been coming here since 1964, and uh, it was uh, well, it was pretty much the same now, except, uh, I don't know, it's about the same, basically. Yeah. I could tell all kinds of stories about that. But, uh, you know, now I've known people who started on marijuana, and next thing you know, they were drinking, and vice versa. And I know one thing, as soon as I pick up one drink, I'm on, I was mostly a four or five day vendor man, my whole thinking changed. And the value of money, people are. And I'm just lucky I don't have any felonies. I have, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 uh, yeah. go to jail you know, overnight. One time when I first came to Chicago, they had me locked up in a little town with the cook for five days and started me just cooling off. Some other guy was driving my car, we had an accident. He must have paid him off or something. I don't know what happened. Uh, but anyway, so I got more control over my uh, life today. And, um, 
one reason why I don't come to a college all the time now, I do some other things. I do some, some entertainment, you know, hear some good, good, good old uh, folk music and stuff like that, you know, coffee houses and, and a few other things. It's a little more of a balance of my life. Uh, uh, now, I don't work the 12 steps in any like a lot of people, but the, I think the uh, fellowship did it for me. I became a death volunteer for four or five mustard seed locations, 15 and a half years. Every Wednesday from Central Town, I never missed early. And then, uh, and that, and, and, uh, and so forth, you know. I'm trying to say too much too fast here. Okay, now, the trips I took when I drank, I very seldom got started when I left, because when I did, I don't think, I don't know if I'd gotten back or not. And uh, so after I got sober, I took all kinds of trips to see what you know. And I, I saved my money, like they said, you know, for any day now the banks went broke. Well, I put the hell broke, but they won't pay no interest on no money. And I'm having a rough time, uh, you know, uh, money-wise. But I have food, shoulder, and clothing, and I try to be grateful for what I have and not sorry for what I don't have. Uh, but, I don't take one drink for one day, keep one person sober, and I like to remember my last drunk because of the cat. It wasn't. Okay, I have a couple other things on here, I guess. Uh, oh, I don't know exactly what to say. Anyway, I, when I first came around the AA, I was drinking about 20 strong cups of coffee, loaded with sugar and everything. And it was bought on my stomach, so I got away and I drank a little tea. So today, that's my fix, a little tea. So I'll just close with this. There was an Indian, he drank too much tea one night, and he woke up the next morning in his tea pee. <laughs> My name is Michael Foley. I got a pretty low opinion of the head shrinker industry. I've been told that I couldn't use the word head shrinker because it was a pejorative, and I told the guy who told me that. I said, I know it's a pejorative, that's why I'm using it. I mean to be pejorative toward the head shrinker industry. But I have to give credit where credit is due. Psychiatrists have cured teenage depression. When a woman has a child and the child is a teenager, maybe the child ain't getting along too well in high school or something, or a little bothered, a little upset. The woman takes the kid to the doctor, the doctor says, well, take the kid to the head shrinker, and the head shrinker says, your son is suffering from depression. Here's a prescription. So the woman takes her kid home, she gets a prescription filled, and she gives the kid the pills exactly the way the psychiatrist prescribed the pills. And three days later, the kid commits suicide. And the kid is no longer suffering from depression. These head shrinkers have cured teenage depression by getting teenagers to commit suicide. Now there's another thing about head shrinkers. They cannot make money telling people, oh, you're not in such bad shape, man. You gotta live with a few things, you gotta work through a few issues in your life. You're having difficulty in your life, but it ain't so bad. I can help you work through things a little bit. They can't make much money doing that. They gotta tell you you got a disorder. Anybody who uses the phrase post-traumatic stress disorder is wrong because there's no such thing as post-traumatic stress disorder. It does not exist. Post-traumatic stress is very real, but it is not a disorder. Post-traumatic stress is a normal human response to a really horrible experience, maybe a horrible experience that just lasts a few seconds, Maybe a horrible experience, maybe a person has really had a horrible life for six months or a year, and they're bummed out by it. That's what post-traumatic stress is. The trauma is the horror that you suffer in your life. Maybe it's a physical injury, but maybe you're not. Maybe you've really had some kind of bad experience. You got held up on the street and robbed. You didn't get shot or anything, but it was just a horrible psychological experience. Post-traumatic stress is very real, and you're bummed out by the bad experiences you have, but it is normal. But a head shrinker can't make money off you by telling you, 
you had a horrible experience, you're bummed out, you gotta think it through, you gotta understand yourself, you gotta understand what's happening in your life, but you're not an insane friggin' lunatic, you do not have a disorder, you're normal. But they can't make money telling you that. Another thing is attention deficit and disorder in kids. <laughs> The first thing a kid, in fact, before a kid starts school, his parents start telling him. And when a kid starts school the first day, the teacher says, sit down, shut up, don't move, and don't open your mouth, don't do anything unless I tell you to. A lot of kids get antsy in an environment like that. <laughs> so the head shrinker says, the kid has attention deficit disorder. He can't sit there for four hours straight without moving. Take these pills and bring them to my counseling session. And he makes all kind of money off it. There's one more thing, and this is not a joke I'm going to say. Head Shrinkers has lost a lot of their business because paranoia has been cured. There's not one human being in the United States of America who is paranoid anymore, no matter what they were before. That's because paranoia is when a guy thinks somebody's watching him and is out to get him. And nobody's watching the guy and nobody's out to get him. That's paranoia. But when somebody is watching the guy and somebody is out to get him, the guy ain't paranoid. He's aware of what's going on. And that's what it is in our country these days. The government is watching all of us and they're screwing us. They really are out to get us and they're getting us. So if you think they're watching you and you're out to get you, you're right. You understand what's going on, but you're not paranoid. Anyway, I really have a low opinion of head shrinkers. I think most of them, the vast majority, are charlatans. If anybody was a psychiatrist and he has any interest in assisting his patient, the vast majority of people can be helped with some conversation, a little counseling. Again, like I said, a little bit. Point not, the person does have some real difficulties in their life, but trying to help the people work through their life and understand their life and get through these things. But they can't make money off that. They make money off of extended counseling sessions that go on once or twice a week for months or years. And another thing I've heard several people say, that they were going to counseling sessions with head shrinkers once or twice a week for several months or whatever until their insurance money ran out. And when their insurance money ran out, then the psychiatrist said, hey, you're doing a lot better. You don't have to come here anymore. <laughs> That's all I got. Thank you. Um, Gene Holman, um, when I took acid, I... I recorded my trip with a tape recorder and I was out for two hours and then I woke up and then I had my trip. Is that happened to anyone else? Okay. Um, what I had an experience of spiritually was not with any psychedelics but with grass. And all of my experiences with grass were so spiritual. They brought me up to um, seeing that everything is one and that the universe is beautiful. That's it. With regard to the last comment that was made, all I have to say is out of sight. Um, I would say this. First, I would like to thank the speaker for a very enlightening presentation. I would say, however, and I'm not going to get into the argument here as to whether or not drugs should be legalized. That will be resolved by people who may or may not be more competent than I am, depending on whether it's the psychologist to resolve it or the politicians. But I will say that if, it is to be, if this stuff is to be legalized, it better be done with great care. That's number one. Number two, um, I would say simply this, that opportunities have to be created in, on the south and west sides of this city and elsewhere so that minority youth have something else to do besides sell drugs. I think that's what's responsible for most of the homicides that have been going on in this city for quite some time. And I don't think you have to be a psychiatrist 
or a rocket scientist to figure that one out. That's number, uh, that's next. I would also say, however, that I deeply, that while I am not a member of the medical or mental health professions, I deeply resent the slurs that were made by a previous speaker on the mental health profession. As someone who has been a patient of a psychologist for some time, uh, including one who I saw for over 40 years who helped me with my learning disability and who helped me navigate my way through the shoals caused my parents' divorce, caused by my parents' divorce, I benefited greatly from it. And I'm sorry, I don't buy the arguments that were, are, that were put forth by a previous speaker who, and admittedly I'm only a lay person, who strikes me as perhaps being a little paranoid himself. Thank you. I, uh, I think our speaker was a little too optimistic on, on one point, unfortunately. Uh, one of the reasons that marijuana is illegal and has been so passionately demonized is that alcohol prohibition ended in the depths of the Depression. And the job of prohibition agent vanished. And there sure weren't any other jobs. And some recently former prohibition agents started fanning the flames of the anti-marijuana bandwagon and uh, in a couple of years after tripe like the infamous reefer madness um, we effectively outlawed marijuana. Um, the war on drugs so far has cost about one and a half trillion dollars, that's with a T. It has also caused, caused, uh, um, cost uh, well over 100,000 murders. It's destabilized half a dozen countries and a few other things. But right now I'm, I'm on the follow the money track. Uh, the, the, the war on drugs has been examined pretty thoroughly from a lot of viewpoints. But there's one which somewhat to my surprise, I have never been able to find serious research on. How many jobs exist because of the war on drugs? A whole lot of cops, a whole lot of lawyers, a whole lot of judges, a very large fraction of the entire prison industry. Uh, I once sat down and tried to itemize and, you know, secondary, tertiary, whatnot. The war on drugs may be close to a million jobs. If some, through, through whatever bizarre, amazing, implausible process, if there's a sudden burst of sanity in this country, that means half a million to a million people are looking at being out of work. And they don't want to be. I'm really not sure. I mean, we're getting where we're, the, the politicians are being forced toward sanity on marijuana, but on psychedelics, I'm going to have to see it before I believe it. I, I'd love to be optimistic, but I'm not. Hello. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion on youth and there's been a lot of discussion on the role of psychotherapy and there's been a lot of discussion on drugs in general and the war on drugs but you know what I really want to focus is on is you know psychedelics as a medication you know I think that's what Bruce was striving for to use it in terms of psychotherapy to help help someone get a better understanding of who they are um, I work in a nursing home, and I can tell you that through the state of Illinois, they are decreasing the amount of limitations on actual medications. You know, it's so easy to give Ativan or prescribe something to decrease dopamine or increase serotonin. Again, they want more therapeutic approaches than pharmacological approaches, okay? So, you know, with this being said, you know, I've heard a lot, you know, using psychedelics in terms to enlighten someone's mind, you know, to help them get a greater spiritual enlightenment. Why not meditation? You know, Buddhists have been practicing for years. Um, meditation, you know, 
being present in the common moment, having, you know, meditation in general, no matter what kind of meditation, I think strives for the same thing. I think, you know, we should get out of the mindset that we need something to make us better. I think, you know, we've talked a lot about depression. Some gentlemen said that, you know, they cured, you know, juvenile depression. I think that, I think there, I don't know the exact figures, but there are so many individuals in America today that are on an antidepressant. Anytime you're not feeling 100% and you're feeling not well, go to an antidepressant. Does it really, do you really need an antidepressant? That's something that needs to be asked. Um, so, you know, I definitely think one of the things that should be asked is, you know, are you exchanging one thing for the other thing? You know, you talked a lot about, you know, the fact that, you know, maybe in the first 36 months you're going to have, you know, the love that you wanted, so you look through external factors. So my, if you're not finding, if you're using the external factors, are you using psychedelics to bring that into your life as well? What happens if, you know, when I when I was I was in, I was listening to your presentation, I kept on thinking about waking life, total recall, you know. <laughs> Instances where, you know, I don't like to live this life, I don't like my normal reality, so I want to transcend into a different reality. I like that reality a little bit better. So in my mind, that seems like it forms to more of an abuse of these psychedelics, you know. Yes, it's helpful. Yes, it may not be that addictive or harmful. But, you know, you are exchanging <coughs> one frame of mind for another frame of mind. So is one better than the other? That's to be, we need to ask that question. Um, I, I definitely think the war on drugs is a completely different situation. Um, I definitely think we should, you know, what is the real benefit of doing this and what can we do alternatively to get the same results? Um, and I think that they don't have to be as extreme as psychedelics, even though I do agree that they may work. But the question I want to ask is, do we actually need it? You're, you're you got five minutes. So I was thinking about the uh, the concept of stigma and how stigma plays into the concept of using psychedelics. You brought up Timothy Leary and uh, where psychedelics were placed in the 60s and the 70s, and then where they are now and how are they being used now based off of where they could have been used based off of that time period and a lot of it has to do with that stigma and that they've been placed in a category where they've been seen as something that is not necessarily therapeutic and I, I agree with what you're saying but is it really something that does not have a therapeutic potential because of what it actually has or the um, stigma that has been created for it. Um, I think that there is a lot of potential for it, but it hasn't really been able to been perceived just because of a uh, concept that's been created around it. That's kind of how I see it. That's the only thing that I want to say about it is that we don't really know yet because it hasn't really fully been allowed. Like you said, the research has been stopped, and and we, we don't we just don't know yet. You know, we we don't know. And maybe if it was allowed to be researched a little further, maybe we could see something that hasn't been seen yet. That's all I have to say. I'm Rhonda Farron. And thank you for the presentation. I think that uh, it's pretty funny if you got your way and you used LSD to cure alcoholism, then you would have uh, what Reefer Madness claims that you know that you're going from the lower drug to the higher drug. So uh, I. I just think that's funny. But obviously, if it actually cured the alcoholism 
and it was a one-time use, then the person would actually be off drugs. So you kind of have bo both the pro and the con there. Uh, of course, I've mentioned before, I'm a folk dancer. And at the beginning of your conference, you have a bunch of people not exactly folk dancing, not doing intricate steps or folk dances, traditional folk dances, but they are holding hands and getting pulled along this, this line of people and having a good time. And I, I, I've been in those groups as well as specific international folk dances that are more organized. And I can tell you that you can feel really pretty fantastic if you just let yourself go and let yourself drag, be dragged along, whether you're on acid or not, which I've never been on that I know of. Anyway, uh, I think that one thing that interestingly could dovetail with the controlled use of LSD would be the the introduction of harm reduction centers, which you may have heard of. Uh, I don't know how many people here have heard of them. They're apparently being done in, I never can remember, Australia or New Zealand, uh, where what the idea of it is that if you go in the front door, you go out the back door so nobody knows who you are, and you can shoot up or participate in whatever drug use you want in a controlled environment where health professionals are watching you so that you don't dump your needles on the street where anybody can come along and get hurt from them, and also where you're, you won't OD. So controlled substance and con use and controlled use of substances go together. And lastly, I agree with David Zucker about the fact that you've got to have jobs if you want people not to sell uh, not to sell drugs. I mean, there has to be something else for people to do. And, oh, one thing about marijuana is there was an NPR interview where they asked a drug dealer, well, what do you think about legalization of marijuana? And he said, well, I don't know. Even if they do that, they'll give them the bad stuff and we'll still sell the good stuff. Uh, uh, okay, Charlie. <laughs> All right, let's see here, right? Uh, let's thank our speaker again. A very presentation. Thanks for putting together your PowerPoint there. And I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, I, I deal very often on occasions as a, a union official. And people come show up in my office in very stressful situations such as they are in danger of losing their job and things like that, I don't think I could say, well, I think you need some psychedelics right now, you know. I think you need a good union official. Um, uh, regarding this, I hit on it already. Uh, I don't feel any particular need for a direct experience of God. Uh, you see my one chart there, you actually had level, I think it's level three and four, you begin to experience uh, the higher powers or extraterrestrial spirits. And I don't know what that has to do with anything whatsoever. Uh, you know, I, I religion, I, I've got to draw the line on it. Because, I mean, you look at the lives of the saints, these people maybe could benefit by some psychedelics. I don't think it's something we want to strive for. Uh, Freedom from Religion's coming to town. This, this, you got to read their literature uh, regarding, you know, re and then saying that you should have substances will enhance religious rituals. I don't understand this. If there, in fact, is some deep abiding belief system, what does it need chemicals? Um, you're mixing the spiritual and the physical world here. Uh, regarding traumatic stress, and you're making claims that psychedelics will cure traumatic stress, but then again I was thinking that doing a trip is a traumatic stress. I, 
don't know if it would be a good idea to do it all over again. You know, and then again, I was, I was picking on him. I was picking on him about this controlled setting because if that, that's what we need at the college is a controlled setting. <laughs> Everything will be fine in a controlled setting. I mean, yeah. Nothing went wrong because it was controlled, you know. Um, let's see, some of your comparisons of the drugs I raised issues with. Uh, you know, there's another one I deal with, the lost days of work. Uh, if you have chemicals, how many days of work do you lose? Actually, uh, with marijuana, nobody misses work with marijuana. I remember that one. It, it doesn't, it's not like alcohol or is, is one that will cause, you know, in terms of measuring harmful effects. Um, regarding legalization of drugs, um, I do lobbying, and you've got to look who's out there and who, who might not be in favor of what you're advancing. And I'll tell you, these suburbanites, especially these suburban soccer moms, this isn't going to be, this isn't going to happen. This is like their worst nightmare. You know, that Johnny is going to, jo you had Johnny using acid? I mean, this is not, not, not in their intellectual framework. Yes, it's just not there. They're just not going to buy out. This is their worst nightmare, you know, earning it. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, I mean, I've been using drugs. Uh, I, I knew that when I was in campus in the late 60s, there was drugs. I, I only heard about them. <laughs> you and I heard about it, but I don't know any more than that. Now, last of all, though, this thing about being nurtured when you're on your first 36 months of life and relationship with your parents, which I must say, I didn't have a perfect relationship with my parents even at the age of three, but we came to an understanding. <laughs> but uh, I don't think it had any lingering detrimental. This thing about the womb, too, I mean, that's birth trauma stuff. I, I think that's going back a little bit further. Um, yeah, everything, it, 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 it probably has applications. I'll, go, I'll put it in this way, Gary. This is a good statement. In the right situation, it does have application. Uh, whether or not it has any widespread uh, therapeutic use across all illnesses and things like that, obviously we don't know. There's no been no some research on this. You know, uh, is is it better than I was thinking? All the other therapies that are out there, they have primal stream and these other things. We've had we hosted them. Uh, even some here at the college and things of that nature over the years. Um, yeah, will they fit the right setting? Certainly. Um, I guess if it's beneficial with the scoping with uh, life situations, you know, then hey, why not? You know, if it can improve somebody's life, you know. And as you say, you know, with the right situation, it probably might. All right, thank you very much. Let's get this straight. You guys want to legalize psychedelic drugs. You want to legalize pot. Then why in the hell are you blasting me about using tobacco? <laughs> it's addictive, it's poisonous, it stinks, and it's taxed. And we have to breathe it too when you like it. And yes, why then can't you let us congregate in a bar where you are not allowed? <laughs> I'm not stopping you. Okay. I pay more taxes for this stuff in Cook County than I do in the suburbs. The government's already soaking it to me with this stuff. I'm paying for your health care. I'm paying for your roads. It's now nine bucks a pack. In McHenry County, it's seven. And as they said, there's a black market developing. I can go into some parts of the city of Chicago and get them for five bucks a pack. 
legal and taxed. Really? Bought, out, bought out, they buy them out of Virginia and they come up here and they sell them out of the trunks of their cars. Wow. Sure. Now, oh, yeah. wow. this, these are legalized and taxed pretty well. It's almost easier to get an illegal drug than it would be to get a pack of cigarettes in the city of Chicago. <laughs> oh, that's why you want it illegal. So, you know, if, if uh, the government makes a hell of a lot of money off of me, the tobacco smoker, I would love to see these drugs legalized, taxed, and done just like the tobacco industry, because maybe then we can get our damn deficit under control. Thank you. said, if you, you know, once you get the message, you can hang the phone up. So the thing that this does is it can give you an experience that you don't have to go back to. That's that's the point. You know, this isn't something that uh, necessarily people want to do repeatedly. But if, especially what Stanislav Grof found was that if you give people a, a pretty in, intense experience where they work through a lot of 
issues. They don't necessarily want to go back to that. So this is, I mean, one of the problems is that to have to call substances like this drugs. So there's been an entomology of, of development of words to kind of change it. I mean, it was psychotomimetic, mimic psychosis, uh, and then psychedelic, and now the word that they use is entheogen, which means the God within, kind of like the sacred, you know, uh, controlled setting use of it. So this is a different paradigm, the fact that we even have to use the word drugs. You take an aspirin to cure a headache. You don't take LSD to cure a headache unless it's a cluster headache. But um, the, the point is that it is more, um, it is not to get rid of something in, in cases like medicine, uh, the medicinal drugs that we're talking about. So it is a, it's a different paradigm that we don't even have the words for. That's why you know they made up the word psychedelic, mind manifesting. There were no words for it. When people first did the experiences, they couldn't find anything in the literature to, to do this. So I think this is a great untapped potential. Uh, and that what we're talking about is doesn't send the wrong message or encourage recreational use because plenty of kids in my class abuse the drugs that I'm talking about, like MDMA and so forth, it gives me a chance to address a harm reduction approach uh, to tell them what the research shows they should or shouldn't be doing in a purely scientific way. So, you know, there, there's a saying in the field of addiction, you know, dead addicts don't recover. So you want to keep people alive long enough that they can change their lives. And I, and I, my, you know, kind of my summary of the whole thing is that if you give somebody an experience that will change their life, uh, Anton Wilson talked about that. He said psychedelics can change you on a dime, you know, uh, then why not? And uh, as far as treating pathology, that's kind of the way we're, what we're stuck with. So. Uh, the hope is that it'll move toward more of a wellness perspective than treating pathology. So I thank everybody and uh, thank peace, love, and soul.